I talked about international environmental agreements and international climate policy from the perspective of game theory and argued that there's little hope, little prospect for uh, an international agreement on greenhouse gas emission reduction because it is a global public good. Uh, what I'm going to do now is review what actually what happened during the actual climate negotiations. Um, and essentially find uh, the same thing. Um, international climate policy has a long history of good intentions, but little uh, to show for. Climate change was put on the scientific agenda, or climate change caused by uh, the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere was put on the scientific agenda in 1896 by Santa Eugenia, who you see here. But uh, research really only started going in the uh, early 1980s. The politicians started paying attention to this fairly soon after. In the mid-1980s there were two conferences uh, in the Alps and then in 1988 there was a big conference in the Netherlands um, and then in 1992 uh, there was the Stockholm Plus, Plus 20 conference, uh, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro. Um, as I said, in 1972 there was a big conference on this topic uh, in Stockholm where all sorts of issues around the environment were first uh, discussed in an international context. Um, and 20 years later in Rio in 1992, people got together again and negotiated no uh, less than five international treaties on the environment. Uh, three of those treaties have since died. Uh, one is very sickly. Uh, but the fifth one is alive and kicking, and that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, <clears throat> the uh, UNFCCC uh, was a roaring success, as I said, negotiated in 1992, entered into force in 1995, ratified by basically every country uh, on the planet. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, it is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, it does not actually negotiate much, it does not actually promise much, uh, but really it sets the rules for later negotiations, um, but doesn't really specify what uh, the outcome should be or anything uh, of the sort. And there's only two substantial um, two substantial things in the UNFCCC uh, and the first is that it explicitly talks about the common but differentiated responsibilities of countries um, which is jargon for saying that it's the, 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 the word common uh, refers to the fact that it's a global problem that is what the word common means uh, in this context, uh, the differentiated responsibilities really is code for saying that which countries cause this problem historically and therefore which countries should take the lead in solving it. Uh, the UNFCCC very clearly uh, establishes those two principles. Uh, it, it's hard to argue uh, with that. Climate change is a global problem not necessarily a common problem in the sense that not everybody suffers equally and some people may actually benefit from climate change. Um, the, uh, it's also very hard to disagree with the fact that historically different countries have made very different contributions to uh, the present accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Most of this stuff comes from rich countries, currently rich countries. Um, but the notion that rich countries therefore should take the lead uh, is problematic and it has hindered, um, has hindered progress in the international negotiations for the simple reason that although it is true that past emissions mostly came from currently rich countries, future emissions mostly come from currently poor countries. Uh, it's, and we've seen that over the last 20 years or so, the growth in emissions is mainly driven by uh, countries in East Asia, particularly um, 
particularly China, countries in South Asia, particularly India. And these countries in the international negotiations always point to the differentiated responsibilities. And even though they are responsible for future emissions, they are not responsible for emission reduction. Um, and that is, of course, um, a problem. The countries that are actually more vulnerable to climate change and that hold the keys to future emissions, and that's the only thing we can control, think that countries that emitted a lot in the past should go first, even though they are less vulnerable and actually have less control over the problem. Um, the second thing uh, that the UNFCCC establishes, we've talked uh, before, it says in Article 2 that the ultimate objective of the Convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And even though at the time people thought that the word stabilization didn't mean much, stabilization we now know implies uh, that emissions of carbon dioxide have to go to uh, zero. Um, but mostly what the UNFCCC do, does, uh, did is that it started a series of negotiations and uh, those negotiations are many and they are quite expensive. Um, and that is uh, what you see displayed here in blue. You're looking at the number of meetings that are organized under the UNFCCC and in red you're looking at an estimate uh, of the costs. Uh, so what the UNFCCC specifies is that there shall be a meeting every year and the first year it entered into force in 1995 there was indeed a meeting uh, and about 800 people uh, attended. Um, at uh, the height of the negotiations in uh, 2015, 40, perhaps 60,000 people were in Paris for these meetings. Um, and that is, of course, a very costly uh, affair. Um, the meetings typically take two weeks or so. Uh, so essentially you pay uh, for the salary of um, 40,000 people spend two weeks, that's 80,000 person weeks um, of, of salaries that are devoted to these negotiations. Um, what also happened um, in, in, in the first years, there was a meeting per year, uh, which is the minimum that is prescribed uh, by the international treaty. Uh, but then people discovered that actually these meetings were complicated, the negotiations were complicated, so they went to two meetings per year, that was a large meeting, uh, typically in November and December, and then a smaller meeting uh, somewhere in summer to prepare for the negotiations, and then they discovered that negotiating twice a year was actually not quite enough, uh, so by now they're meeting every three months, there is a round of negotiations, all in preparation for the big meeting uh, in early December. Um, and of course what these meetings do is they create uh, subcommittees so the, or committees and the committees uh, meet separately from the plenary uh, to sort of smooth over uh, some, some details um, and those committees then create subcommittees and so on and so forth um, and all these meetings generate paperwork generate new jargon, treaties, sub-treaties, amendments to treaties and so on and so forth. Um, so that for people who are new to the process it actually is quite intransparent. Uh, so the Secretariat of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change now also organizes uh, training sessions for diplomats who are new to the process to get up to speed with what all the uh, alphabet soup uh, stands for and to talk about why is this particular position taken, which is sometimes peculiar because you don't quite understand the full history of things, uh, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and as a result, in recent years, there was not one meeting a year, uh, but there was typically one or two meetings just under the United Nations Framework Convention, um, uh, uh, one or two meetings per week uh, on this. And it's, it's all... Um, fairly uh, intensive and of course these civil servants then need to report back uh, 
uh, to the people at home uh, and so on and so forth and to prepare for these meetings and it actually is a, almost a full-time occupation uh, for some civil servants to uh, travel to uh, these meetings and that reflects the explosion in costs uh, that you see. Um, I reckon that around $150 million per year is nowadays spent on uh, these meetings, which would all be great and then the if indeed emissions were falling, which they are not. Uh, so it's a bit unclear what all this money uh, is being uh, spent on. But uh, the United Nations Framework Convention says there shall be negotiations and there have been negotiations. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm not going to take you through every little detail because it's just uh, way too much. Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to go through some of the highlights. The very first uh, negotiation was held in uh, Berlin, and you see that in the top uh, left here. Um, I had a long little tour. Um, there actually was almost an agreement, and the agreement was on specific emission reduction targets at specific times and this was the so-called uh, targets and timetables uh, approach where the aim of the negotiations was to get countries to agree to cut emissions by 8 percent by 2010 or by um, <coughs> 12 percent by 2015 that was the aim of uh, the core aim of the negotiations um, and in berlin they almost got there um, not quite. Uh, then there was a negotiation in 1996, but if something fails, then they need to catch their breath for a while. Uh, and in 1997, they returned uh, in Kyoto. You see that at the top uh, right. Um, now I'm missing up my slides. Uh, Kyoto. Um, there was an agreement uh, at the uh, famous or infamous uh, Kyoto Protocol. And the Kyoto Protocol uh, specifies two things. First, it sets targets for selected countries. For Europe, it set a minus 8% uh, target, where minus 8 was for the years 28, 2008 to 2012. Emissions should be 8% below what they were in 1990. That was the uh, EU target, there were targets for Japan and Australia and the US uh, and a few other countries. Uh, so that is one thing uh, that the Kyoto Protocol call specifies. And the second is that it allowed for international trade in emission reduction uh, between countries that had targets between uh, and between countries that had and hadn't targets as well. And we talked about it uh, previously. Uh, so that came out of uh, the Kyoto Protocol. What the Kyoto Pro Protocol did not specify, uh, a couple of crucial things. First, what are emissions? Um, what happens if you miss your emission reduction target? A sort of crucial things. Uh, and to what extent the so-called flexibility uh, instruments, the international trade uh, in emission permits and emission credits, uh, to what extent those instruments may be used. The Kyoto Protocol says, yes, this is allowed up to an unspecified percentage of your emission reduction target. Um, which, of course, <laughs> means that it wasn't properly defined. Um, it also didn't set any sanctions for violating the targets so it said Europe shall reduce uh, its emissions by 8% or else was not specified um, and the thing that might surprise you most is that emissions were not defined and therefore you had a target on something that you could not measure and uh, now this might, might surprise you um, because you often read about emissions and the total quantity of greenhouse gas emissions uh, or the total quantity of greenhouse gas emission reduction, so you might think that we actually know how to define this. But uh, the problem with CO2 emissions, particularly in those days, uh, the problem with CO2 emissions is that there is no direct measurement. It's still there. So CO2 emissions are really derived from other statistics. Uh, for energy use, this is relatively simple. If you have a liter of petrol and you burn that fully, then you know exactly how much CO2 you have emitted because that just follows from the chemical properties. 
of the petrol uh, you uh, put in. Um, so that is relatively straightforward, although of course there's all sorts of different qualities of uh, petrol and diesel and other fuels. And particularly for coal, there's actually a very wide variety uh, of, of types of coal. Um, all with their own specific uh, emission coefficients. Um, for other things, the approximation is actually pretty crude. So we know that cows burp out methane, uh, but we measure that for the occasional cow. It's not that cows go around uh, with uh, things that things around their necks that measure how much methane they emit. That is essentially a few cows in the in the lab and all the rest are extrapolated from that so this is pretty inaccurate uh, same goes for landfill emissions uh, or emissions from paddy uh, rice um, and another thing that is particularly uh, uncertain is that if trees grow they suck up co2 uh, and you can figure that out for a particular tree uh, by measuring how big it is which is easy down at the stem but it's actually uh, trickier to count all the branches and see how big are they really um, and then of course there's also a lot of the tree that is on the ground the roots and everything also store uh, co2 so measuring how much co2 is stored in the biosphere uh, is difficult uh, and approximate and how much CO2 is stored underground is even harder and for those countries that are sort of reforesting that is Europe and uh, North America um, this is actually a substantial sink uh, of CO2 emissions it's actually, it's actually negative uh, CO2 emissions and measuring exactly uh, how much that is is very difficult and that implies that you have some sort of bureaucratic process that says well these are the rules and this is how we approximate this uh, but agreeing on those rules is actually uh, a, a tough thing because different things uh, matter to different uh, countries so actually <laughs> at the time of Kyoto there was no agreement on how to define CO2 emissions so a target was specified over something that was undefined <coughs> um, that relative success of uh, the Kyoto Protocol needed to be reaffirmed later as I said Kyoto was largely uh, unfinished business um, and a year later countries met uh, in The Hague um, and were hoping for a strong deal that the loose ends of Kyoto would be tied up uh, in a way that was particularly good for the environment. Um, that did not happen. Those negotiations in The Hague, you see it in the top left, um, you would think that this was a golden opportunity. Uh, the top negotiator for uh, the US at the time was Al Gore, uh, who you see a uh, picture there. Um, and Al Gore at that time was running for the US presidency and he really needed an international success in um, the climate negotiations to sort of bolster his green uh, credentials and his credentials as an international diplomat. Um, so the Americans were keen on a deal, um, but unfortunately the Europeans couldn't agree amongst themselves and if you read the accounts of what happened uh, during the, the Hague negotiations uh, the Brits said that they wanted a deal but the French didn't and the French said uh, they really wanted a deal but the Germans didn't uh, and the Germans said that they really wanted a deal but the English didn't um, and essentially uh, Al Gore spent two weeks in The Hague waiting for the Europeans to stop fighting uh, amongst themselves which they never did um, that was very unfortunate. Um, there is a wider implication of this, um, and that is that the Europeans were so embarrassed by their lack of agreement and essentially spending 
uh, all this time in an international in the UN forum fighting uh, among themselves, um, that ever since the position of the EU has been pre-negotiated, um, that essentially the countries of Europe have agreed on a common strategy for the climate negotiations, um, which is one thing, uh, but because these are democratic countries that want to be accountable and transparent, uh, it's not only that it's a pre-negotiated strategy, but it's also a pre-announced uh, strategy. And as a result, the European Union is essentially no longer at the table in international climate negotiations. So there's no point in talking to the Europeans, because you can actually read on the internet what they're going to say. Uh, so you can talk to them, you can make small talk with them, but they're not allowed to deviate from their position. And because they cannot deviate from their position, they also cannot haggle. <laughs> they have a fixed offer, and it's a fixed offer, and the only thing they can do is repeat that offer with different words, but it cannot change the offer. So it's actually no point in negotiating with the Europeans uh, on anything. Um, uh, so that is um, one unfortunate uh, outcome of uh, the shambles uh, in The Hague. The next time that the international climate negotiators met, uh, Al Gore was not president. Well, some people would say that he was duly elected president, but he, uh, the Supreme Court decided otherwise, uh, and Bush the Younger uh, was uh, president. Um, the Bush administration has always uh, surprised me uh, when it comes to climate policy. Uh, Bush the Younger actually campaigned, the in the first campaign, campaigned with the promise of carbon taxes and strong climate policy, and his father, uh, Bush the Elder, was very pro-environment uh, during the Rio negotiations. Um, but uh, it was uh, Dick Cheney who actually took over uh, this particular bid uh, of the uh, US government um, and he is was is uh, an oil man and wanted nothing to do uh, with climate policy uh, so the US position uh, for eight years was very anti uh, climate um, nonetheless uh, in the negotiations after that in Marrakesh um, a deal was reached uh, because the Americans were not really playing. Um, the loose ends of Kyoto essentially stayed loose. Uh, so there was a very generous interpretation of how much CO2 is really taken up uh, by plant growth. Um, and there were no restrictions placed whatsoever on the use of international flexibility uh, instruments, you could trade uh, as much, you could meet your entire uh, emission reduction target by importing permits from elsewhere. Um, and um, there was essentially also no sanction for missing your uh, target. So what the Marrakesh uh, Accord specified that if you in 2012 have missed your target as specified uh, by the Kyoto Protocol, then in the next commitment period, by 2020, uh, you should do 30% more, but um, you should do 30% more of something that had yet to be specified. Uh, so the sanction was essentially toothless, right? You, if you miss your target, you have to accelerate, but you haven't defined your speed yet. Uh, so, uh, acceleration, uh, or a promise of acceleration, or a sanction of acceleration, um, was, um, it's just a, a meaningless uh, sanction. Uh, and then the fourth thing that happened in America is, is that some countries actually renegotiated their target, and uh, what was a very stringent target became a not so stringent target. Uh, so, yeah. This was not uh, a great day uh, for uh, for climate. Um, after Marrakesh, uh, there's been because the United Nations Framework Convention says there shall be negotiations, so there were negotiations. There were many more conferences uh, after that. It was mostly mostly about fine tuning language uh, in, in in the things. Um, 
the uh, Marrakesh Accords and therewith the Kyoto Protocol entered into force only in 2005. Uh, there was a clause that specified so many countries representing so much of the emissions uh, needed to ratify the Kyoto Protocol and the Marrakesh Accords. Uh, and the country that held out for a long time, that was the linchpin, was Russia. And for a long time, Russia played the Americans against the uh, Europeans. Um, uh, but in the end, uh, the European Union offered greater bribes to Putin. And he signed the Kyoto Protocol and then it entered into force in 2005. By that time, Australia had dropped out uh, and the US had uh, dropped out as well. Um, so, pretty weak. And going back to uh, the game theory, in particular the cartel formation, essentially, I mean, I mean Scott Barrett predicted that, that uh, cartels, coalitions would be small or sh shallow. Uh, so, small and deep, or large and shallow. Yeah, he was wrong there because the Kyoto Protocol is essentially small in the sense that it was essentially a treaty uh, between Europe, Japan and New Zealand. Um, so it was small in the number uh, of participants, uh, but it was also shallow in the sense that it actually did not impose great constraints on the emissions of these countries. Uh, but that is uh, the outcome of the first bit of climate negotiations. Um, this is by now uh, history. Um, the targets of the Kyoto Protocol were set for the years 2008 to 2012. Um, the Kyoto Protocol itself did not expire. The stuff on uh, policy instruments um, is still uh, in force. Um, People are trying to nego renegotiate this, but for the moment, uh, these things are still uh, in force. Um, the targets were set for the year 2008 to 2012, when people started negotiating, um, started negotiating new targets uh, in uh, Bali in 2007, uh, where essentially the plan was um, the plan was to agree on new targets in uh, the year 2009 um, and uh, they tried in 2009 uh, in Copenhagen and that's uh, at the top uh, Bali is at the bottom uh, bottom left um, but they failed uh, Copenhagen was uh, a strange Spectacle. Uh, so, in the run up to Copenhagen, there was an enormous expectation. So, there was an international agreement in Bali that in 2007 and in 2009 we would agree on new targets for the year 2020. And everybody thought that this would happen. And uh, if you read the run-up in the press, there was great hope that, yes, they are going to do this. Uh, and what happened in Copenhagen is that basically all world leaders uh, showed up. Obama was there, uh, Merkel was there, uh, Sarkozy was there, Brown was there. Really a great many uh, world leaders showed up. And they don't, people like that don't show up if they don't think there is a realistic chance of success because failure is the last thing you want as a, a politician um, so expectations were running very high um, and it became very clear rapidly that there was no agreement on what those targets should be it was the basic free riding yes we should do something about the problem but after you um, you should take the lead, not me, uh, was essentially the sentiment um, that was in the negotiations. And at one point, uh, Obama got so fed up uh, with the spectacle of 200 countries trying to negotiate 
uh, then he walked out with uh, a few others Brazil South Africa um, India and China and essentially they <laughs> ran off and with the five of them uh, negotiated a deal uh, the problem of course if you do that but the Europeans were furious and they were not taken seriously for the reasons that they had nothing to say anyway the position was fixed uh, but they were furious that they were at least not granted the courtesy of being at the table okay, all the Argentinians were of course furious uh, that the Brazilians were invited but they are not the Nigerians were furious uh, that the South Africans were at the table but they are not um, and uh, essentially the whole thing collapsed even though there was a deal between those five countries nobody else bought it um, and uh, the backlash in the media you see a small example of that here uh, was absolutely furious but essentially what happened in Copenhagen is the same thing as that happened in Berlin and that happened in uh, in Kyoto and that is that countries try to come together and set a legally binding target on providing a global public good and that is difficult and they could not agree in the end because it was in everybody's interest that somebody else would take uh, the lead uh, so in that sense Copenhagen just confirmed what a basic uh, game theoretic model uh, would uh, predict uh, there was a meeting after that in Cancun uh, you also see that there and uh, the outcome of Cancun was we got to keep trying uh, and there was agreement in Durban uh, the year after to um, try and agree uh, in 2015 and that was confirmed in Doha in 2012 so essentially for three years the only thing that people could agree on was to keep trying um, in the run-up to the 2015 um, negotiations something changed and this was formally acknowledged in Lima in the year 2014 and you see uh, Lima displayed there and that is that the legally binding targets and timetables that people tried in Berlin and Kyoto and in Copenhagen uh, were replaced by intended nationally determined contributions which is a very ugly uh, term um, so what do these uh, words mean the word contribution refers to contribution to international climate policy um, nationally determined means that this is not an international negotiation this is not a target that was set by an international treaty no these targets or these contributions are set by national parliaments if that is how your country works uh, or by the president if that is how your country works um, so no longer internationally binding legally binding no this is nationally determined the role is essentially Lima shifted the responsibility of target setting from the United Nations back to the nation states um, and the word intended means aspirational this is no longer a hard target but this is a soft wish um, so this is a fundamental uh, shift um, this is essentially what economists would call a platinum review system um, and it is ugly um, but it is a tried and tested method of providing international public goods uh, so what happens if violence breaks out in a particular country and that threatens to spill over borders or that threatens to kill uh, loads of people what do you do uh, you organize an international uh, jamboree where you have a series of speakers who describe the situation and say it's all going to be very bad if you don't intervene um, and then you go around with a begging bowl to uh, provide a peacekeeping force and Japan uh, will send money and Germany will send logistical uh, support um, 
and uh, the Americans will provide hardware and the Pakistanis will send in troops and the Nigerian will send in troops and that is how you build up a peace force. And is it enough? Is it quick? No, never. Uh, does it work? Yes. Uh, similarly, if you have a, a pandemic breaking out and you have a risk there, in a country with a weak uh, public health system, what do you do? You organize an international conference where you lament how bad it's going to be, and then you go around with a begging bowl, and uh, India will send nurses, and uh, France will send tents, and the UK may send in doctors, or Cuba may send in doctors, and the Japanese again provide uh, the money for all this, uh, and that is how you create how you mobilize the resources to hopefully get this uh, pandemic uh, under control. Um, it's never enough. Uh, contributions are unfair, uh, unfairly distributed, uh, and so on and so forth. But it works in most cases. Uh, of course, at the moment, we have a pandemic going on where it did not work. Um, that is how you provide a global public good. You drum up public support and then you essentially ask countries for voluntary contributions to help keep this thing under control or solve it. Um, and that is essentially what the international climate regime is about now. The intended nationally determined contributions are essentially the United Nations going around to the bagging ball and asking Germany, would you please cut your emissions? UK, would you please cut your emissions? Um, <clears throat> there, there is a, a good thing uh, from a theoretical perspective about plans and review systems, uh, and that is that if you're a rational actor and there's uncertainty about the future, which there always is, and you're risk averse, then if you go into a negotiation where the outcome is a legally binding target, then really your best strategy is to under-promise and over-deliver. You say, I'm going to do 5%, you know, really in the back of your mind you think, I can do 7%, maybe 9%, but if I promise 9%, then I have to do 9%, so I'm not going to promise 9%, I'm going to promise 5% or 4%. Um, but if the negotiations are, negotiations are really about aspirations that you express, you can be much more honest because there's no sanction of getting your forecast wrong and therefore you go for your best guess rather than for the minimum that you're sure you can deliver. Um, and the good thing about sort of those more ambitious aspirations rather than rather uh, uh, conservative promises um, is that it also allows other countries to be more ambitious. If the Germans announce that they're going to do 10%, then the French will think, yeah, if they can do it, then probably we can do it too. And they're more keen to come uh, forward um, with more ambitious promises. Uh, so this is actually a good thing. From an environmental perspective, it sounds awfully weak. Uh, but actually, from a behavioral uh, perspective, you can expect more uh, from a platinum review system uh, than from uh, legally binding uh, targets. So this was done in Lima. Lima is a poor country, it's in a, the capital of a poor country, Peru. Uh, so you cannot uh, put this on uh, the international agreement. Uh, the Paris Accords, or the Paris Agreement, is um, what essentially codified what was agreed in uh, in Lima, but in the hard work was done in Lima. Um, and I'll show you uh, the language uh, that was agreed on these things in a uh, minute. Uh, another thing happened uh, in Paris, so people sort of caught on that we were going from binding targets to plans and review. Um, so another thing uh, that happened in Paris is that an overall target uh, was set for the warming, the global warming that was allowed. Um, and these targets are pretty tough. Uh, the Paris Agreement says that the world should not warm by more than 2 degrees Celsius 
relative to pre-industrial, and we have already seen one degree of warming uh, since pre-industrial, um, and that was really the upper limit. The Paris Agreement says well below two degrees and aiming for one and a half uh, degrees. Um, so that is the global target. Um, but at the same time, um, no national targets are set by Paris. Uh, so really the obligation that are put in the Paris Agreement uh, on countries is that every country is obliged to have a climate policy and there is also language that the next climate policy should be more ambitious than the current climate policy uh, but there's absolutely no mechanism in the Paris Agreement that those national targets, national aspirations add up to the global aspiration so this is just a paper tiger I think it was put in there to placate uh, the Greens uh, into applauding this, uh, but it has no uh, teeth uh, whatsoever. Um, this has another uh, implication, um, and that is, mm, I haven't talked about that, what happened between 1995 in Berlin uh, all the way up uh, to, uh, to Lima, is that these international targets, these global targets, had to be agreed by everybody. This is the UN uh, context. Uh, so targets and agreements are set essentially by unanimity. There's no voting. Um, and the game that um, poorer countries had been playing for a very long time is saying these targets aren't stringent enough. Climate change is a big problem. We are the main victims of climate change. The targets that you guys are suggesting, Americans, Europeans, Japanese, they are not stringent enough. You need to do more. Um, and because the targets had to be agreed to everybody, they actually had negotiating power. And the Europeans and the Japanese and occasionally the Americans uh, were too afraid of their electorate to go back home without an agreement. Uh, so instead what they did, rather than accept the more stringent targets suggested by countries in Africa and Latin America uh, and Asia and small island states and those sort of places, rather than agree with those proposed targets, they said, mm, we're going to give you some money if you please agree to do what we think we should be doing. Um, and that uh, always happens and over the years you see the sums of money that are promised to developing countries if they please go along with the targets suggested by the Europeans and the Japanese um, that sum of money increased over time and over time and uh, increased more and more and more um, but in Paris with the intended nationally, de intended nationally determined uh, contributions poor countries lost their leverage because now countries should suggest what they wanted to do and that was their suggestion and poor countries no longer had the right to vote about these things and what you saw for the very first time in the Paris negotiations is that the pledges, and their pledges rather uh, than real monies that flowed, the pledges of additional climate related funding uh, essentially had uh, dried up uh, or did not uh, grow anymore, no additional funding uh, was pledged. Um, and that is because poor countries lost uh, their leverage. Um, so what does the uh, Paris Agreement say? In Article 4.2 it says each party shall prepare, communicate and maintain successive nationally determined contributions that it intends to achieve. Nationally determined, not in legally binding by international law, not a target but an intention. Uh, parties shall pursue domestic mitigation measures with the aim of achieving the objectives of such contributions. So you should not just promise that you're going to do so, but you should actually also promise that you're going to put in place the, uh, the policy instruments. And this is the, the obligation. Every country shall have a climate policy. Uh, each party's successive nationally determined contribution will represent a progression beyond the party's then current nationally determined contribution. So the next 
climate plan should be more ambitious than the current one without defining ambition right it just says a progression um a party may at any time adjust its existing contribution with a view of enhancing its level uh, of ambition so you're allowed to ratchet it up you're not allowed to ratchet it down um the outcome and then the question is how does this these nationally determined contribution relate to the globe um, what they're going to do is every often, every so often, uh, they're going to organize every five years, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to organize a global stock take, where essentially you're going to take all the national promises and add them up and see, is this what we wanted collectively? Um, and they're going to do that, and then the outcome of the global size stop, stock take shall inform parties in updating and enhancing, not weakening, uh, in a nationally determined manner, uh, their actions. So they're going to add up all the promises, conclude that it's not enough, uh, and then they're going to ask the countries to go back and do more. Um, But again, that's nationally determined, right? So you go around to the backing bowl and say, please reduce your emissions. And then at the end of the round, you look into your backing bowl and you see it's not enough. And then you go around to the backing bowl again and you ask everybody to please do more, right? That is the mechanism, um, which is pretty weak. Um, the Paris Agreement also has words about uh, compliance. What happens if you miss your targets um, which is also pretty weak uh, there will be a compliance committee and if you miss your target uh, you're going to be called in front of this compliance committee uh, but this uh, committee has to act in a way uh, that is transparent which is good right so we can follow what is going on what different people are doing it has to be non-punitive, so you can miss your targets. You are called in front of the committee, but the committee cannot punish you. Um, and also the committee has to act in a non-adversarial way. That is, they cannot ask pointed questions even. They can just ask you for an explanation and you can just lie to their faces and they cannot add uh, follow up with um, with questions, right? It has to be non-adversarial. You have to just take their word uh, for it. So this is pretty pretty weak. Essentially, the obligation of the Paris Agreement is that a country shall have a climate policy. Um, and then there's also uh, Article Twenty Eight Point One. And then even if you don't like this, right? And there's absolutely nothing uh, that puts any obligation on you whatsoever um, in terms of emission reduction, uh, the reporting obligations and those sort of things, but that's it. Uh, if you still don't like it, if you want a weaker climate policy still, you can uh, withdraw from its agreement. And that's exactly uh, what uh, the Trump administration uh, did, right? Um, they announced that uh, during uh, the election campaign, uh, this is an election promise uh, that he followed up, um, because of the time lags in when you can initiate the procedure after the, entry, the thing entered into force and the lag and so on and so forth that it did, um, the United States will leave uh, the Paris Agreement the day after the election of uh, Joe Biden. Um, so that is where we're at. Um, game theory predicts that it's very hard to negotiate an international treaty on greenhouse gas emission reduction because it is a global public good. And essentially that is what we have seen in the last 30 years of international negotiations. Nothing much, the emissions are going up. The treaty that has been negotiated, the treaties that have been negotiated are pretty weak. Um, so this is a sobering message. Um, some people say, well, acid rain is an international uh, global good or uh, reduction of acidifying gases is a global public good. And we've done that. Um, 
the hole in the ozone layer is an international global problem. We solved that. So why can't these things uh, be models? And I'll come back in the next video uh, to talk about that.